our friend Peter King. That's another reason why I'm back. Pleased to be back here because Peter King is joining us from NBC Sports for Football Morning America. How are you, Peter? Hey, Rich. How are you? I'm hanging in there, man. I'm hanging in there. Um, let's get right to it, uh, Peter. I gave you the floor on the passing of Don Shula. What's the first memory or first item you thought of when you heard that news about 90-year-old Don Shula passing away earlier on Monday? Fake spike. Huh? You want to keep going in that New York spike there, huh? I love it. You well, had a fake spike, huh? I, uh, you did, huh? I covered, I, co- I covered that game. Okay. And, um, you know, with the Meadowlands. And I just thought it was uh, a lot of that is, is a cool, in some ways, a cool tribute to Don Shula. <clears throat> because I think one of the things about Shula that I really appreciated is how he empowered the people who worked for him. I think he, you know, if you if you were to sort of look at uh, a legacy trait that Don Shula had, it was that, you know, the coaches on his staff, the players on his team, um, you know, always knew that uh, that the coach had had their backs, and I think he empowered people. You know, from Bill Arnsparger on down over the years, I mean, to uh, to do their job to the best of their abilities. And uh, whether it be, you know, a coach who came up with something innovative, uh, whether it be a player like Dan Marino, knowing that, um, you know, he had been empowered to, to do the right thing, to be a, a thinking person on the field. I think that's a part of Shula that that I'll always appreciate. I think the one other thing is, man, he did this for a long time. Sure did. I mean, he he John F. Kennedy was president when he coached his first game, <laughs> and he coached for thirty three years. There aren't a lot of people who can do that. And also, by the way, he had two losing seasons. He never ever in thirty three years had a bottomed out team the worst record he had in his life was six and ten and so i just i think there's so much to admire about the guy he's a very very principled guy um and uh there's a lot of people who will miss don shula and i'm one of them well i mean is there anything that we normally talk about innovation innovator anything on that front uh for the winningest coach in the history of the National Football League? Honestly, Rich, I, I really think that so much of, and I think this cannot be, uh, this doesn't sound like a real innovative thing, but I think if you if you were to ask the people who worked for Don Shula, the, the fact that they were so, um, they felt so empowered, you know, there aren't a lot of head coaches who will, uh, you know, really good head coaches. I, I, Andy Reid really comes to mind. You know, he's always pushing his assistant coaches, and he's all he's always giving them tasks. And you know, guys who work for Andy Reid love working for Andy Reid, and I think it's the same thing with Don Shula. You know, they felt like when they went out there that he had their back, and I, I think that is something that. I mean that's one of the first things I'll, I'll, I'll uh, you know I'll always think about him. He, he was really a good head coach to work for. The thing that yeah, it's funny you mentioned fake Spike because uh, again I'm from New York City. I'm a, a, a Jet fan from since birth. Um, that one hurt a lot. But another Shula moment um, was when the Jets had Freeman McNeil, right? Richard Todd. It's the AFC Championship game. They're going down in the Orange Bowl and. And Shula just let it rain there. Just let it rain. Just he just did not put yeah. the tarp out there. He knew that the running game for the Jets was coming. And then AJ Dewey, I think he's still picking off Richard Todd in that game in that AFC Championship game. And that the gamesmanship that Shula also took part in, yeah, is something that was kind of next level. Peter. Yeah i i always I always thought that. Um, and and it isn't it isn't just because in 33 years coaching, he only had two losing seasons, which is absolutely phenomenal. But I've also I've also thought of him that um, he 
you talk about those little edges that that he would get. You know, there's a guy like Al Davis. You know, you would always think of Al as one of those guys. You know, he'd do whatever he could to get an edge. You know, and a lot of it, maybe he would try to get an edge by going over the line a little bit. The difference, I think, between Shula and so many coaches, you know, um, who who were in his league, is that Don Shula really viewed honor as something that was really important to him. Um, and you know, all the oh, over the years when I when I covered him, and that was kind of early in my national. Uh, football writing career, um, you know the 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 early '90s. My, every experience I had with him was just so incredibly solid and memorable for just the the thought that you know he would always do the right thing, he'd always say the right thing, and uh, I just thought he was a really honorable stand-up guy, very very good to the people. Uh, who did our jobs, too. Um, I really had a high, high regard for him. Peter King here on the Rich Eisen Show, and I've got Shula's longtime friend and somebody who chronicled his career, Hank Goldberg, joining me later on on the Rich Eisen Show in this very hour. Um, Peter, I want to hit you on some news from uh, over the weekend. The Trubisky, um, I guess, non uh, one, but no pickup for the fifth year of his contract was something, I guess, the, the writing was all over the wall with... Foles' acquisition. Uh, what do you make of this? Do you think this is Trubisky's last year in Chicago? It's all going to be up to him. I, you know, first of all, he's going to have to win the job. At some point, he's going to have to outplay Nick Foles. And if he does that and he plays and he's a top 10 or 12 quarterback, the Bears will sign him. Now, we all think that that's not likely. So most likely, yes, I would say uh, this is probably his last year there. But again, Rich, it is in his hands. It has been in his hands for the first three years of his tenure uh, as a Bear. And it's not too late for Mitchell Trubisky to reclaim uh, the long-term starting quarterback job with the Bears. But now there just isn't the kind of support for him that there always was. In his first three years, it was always, we don't care how he plays, he's our guy. And I'm, I'm exaggerating there. Of course they care how he plays. Right. But he was going to be their guy regardless. And now he's not their guy regardless. So he's going to have to show that he can be a winning playoff quarterback for the Bears to keep him beyond this year. Now, I, I look – Part of the reason why I do this is not at all to try and suppose about people's job security. I, really, that's that's not why, why I get into it, but sometimes it is a, a necessary thing to bring up. The, the general manager, Ryan Pace, how does he draft somebody that high um, and the two others he doesn't draft go on to do what they've been doing and still be able to look at management and say, let's try Foles, and if it doesn't work out, let's try somebody else and still be the guy to try something else. Peter? He might not be. <laughs> you know, I think this is a very, very important year for for Ryan Pace's future. Now, you know, look, it's we can sit here and forecast whatever we want to forecast, but this is this is going to be – uh, it's going to be very evident at the end of this year uh, whether uh, Mitch Trubisky should continue uh, with the Bears and whether Ryan Pace should continue with the Bears. And so it's one of those things that, uh, and I and I don't mean I, I don't mean this in any sort of um, what's the best w way to to put it. I don't mean this in any sort of well, Ryan Pace is walking the plank right now. But when you've had six years, I think this is a sixth year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, you know, if, if, if after six years you look at the general manager of your team and you don't see a long-term starting quarterback and you don't see solutions at most of the positions on the team, well, you're probably going to make a change. So 
I think that Ryan Pace, uh, you know, this is obviously a very big year for the Bears, uh, and it's also a big year for Pace. Peter King here on the Rich Eisen Show. How would you term the Dalton signing in in Dallas? There's many different ways. There's a, an upgrade at the position. There's insurance policy. There's insurance policy in case your current quarterback doesn't sign on the dotted line. I mean, how, how what would you make of the Dalton signing in the Metroplex, Peter? I thought it was brilliant. Me too. Um, and I thought it was brilliant for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, if he doesn't play, what are they out? Three or four million bucks? Right. Uh, they have bought the best insurance policy. that he Andy Dalton will play this year as the best backup quarterback in the NFL. And he might have to be more than that. And if he is and you're the Dallas Cowboys, you could win 11 games if you're the Cowboys playing Andy Dalton. There's no doubt in my mind. But, you know, Rich, there's one other there's one other factor here that nobody's really thinking of, but I thought of immediately. I want you to, uh, you know, imagine what football is going to be like in 2020. And part of the reality of football, if it's played, is that players, I would think, I would think are going to be getting tested every week for COVID-19. What happens if you're starting quarterback one week as positive? I feel pretty sure there's going to be a rule that whether it's Patrick Mahomes or Mitchell Trubisky who tests positive, you got to sit for two weeks and you can't have any contact with anybody on your team. So I'm just asking this logical question. What happens if one day, starting quarterback of the Dallas quarterbacks, Dak Prescott, test positive for COVID-19. Then he's got to sit for two weeks, and Andy Dalton's got to play. Now you say, oh, my God, that's that's such a long shot. Well, it is a long shot. But are you telling me that the 1,696 players on active rosters in the NFL this year, if a full season is played, do you think none of them are going to test positive for COVID nineteen? Oh my word! No, that's a that's a that's a silly pipe dream. No, I know that. So so, so uh, I'm imagining too. I mean, I haven't even thought of this for you to bring this up. You, you'd have to probably keep your quarterback separate, right? Because it, you can't just have everybody in the same quarterback room if that happens, because then you'd have to you you'd know, have to quarantine I mean, the whole depth chart, right? That nobody 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 knows, knows, nobody knows nobody the knows. answers to these questions. Correct. You know, I mean, you know, you can't if. You know, I think that would be a bad thing for your football team. Sure. If you say, oh, by the way, uh, Patrick Mahomes uh, and Chad Henney, uh, I think he's the backup there. He is. Patrick Mahomes, Chad Henney, and whoever. Shea Patterson. Those guys are <laughs> not, not going to be in the locker room this year. They're all dressing in across the – in another part of the building. I mean, I mean – you're going to have to treat everybody. I, I, look, I don't. I don't even know exactly. But these are the kind of things that we just don't know right now. But I would doubt that they would set some players on a team apart from others. Peter King, NBC Sports, on the Rich Eisen Show. So, where does this leave Cam? I mean, you read all these reports that Cam's not coming out. Uh, you know, not playing this year if it's not for a starting role. There's no starting roles left unless unless Jacksonville decides it that it's not Minshew's gig. It doesn't make any sense, in my opinion, right now for Cam Newton to sign with anybody. I don't know why he would. If I were Cam Newton, I would just wait until late August, September, maybe even October. Who really needs a quarterback? 32 quarterbacks are not starting every game this year. So if I'm Cam Newton, I'm sitting back there biding my time, waiting until somebody needs somebody, and then I'm riding riding in on my white horse to be a starting quarterback in the NFL. Now, maybe, maybe you could argue he ought to sign with Jacksonville, but I don't know that I'd want to sign in Jacksonville either. How ignominious would it be if a healthy 2015 most valuable player 30 or 31 years old, whatever he is, mm-hmm. is holding a clipboard and Gardner Minshew is playing. That's why, to me, if I'm Cam Newton, 
I'm not signing anywhere until a clear starting opportunity opens up. Last one for you, Peter. Schedule's supposed to come out this week. Um, you know, by all um, accounts, certainly what I'm hearing, too. Uh, I'm going to get a full 17-week schedule placed in front of me to host a, a schedule release show later on this week. Are you hearing about anything in a top left or a top right-hand drawer for the commissioner uh, upstairs from where he did his drafting um, that, uh, that that will be prepared by the scheduling folks from Howard Katz and the rest well, of his I hard-working think, Rich, group? I think the two, kind of the two big factors <clears throat> that you ought to be looking for, I think, is – for the ability to, of the NFL to easily pivot um, in the event that something goes wrong. First of all, I don't. I disagree with releasing the schedule this week. There's no need to do it. It's not going to just start uh, uh, creating a bunch of commerce. People aren't going to start, you know, uh, 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 you know, planning road trips and buying plane tickets and buying tickets to games. I mean, normally that's why you put out a schedule in April. It's a, it's a kind of a, a marker in the road for you to really start looking at, um, okay, here are the games I'm going to this year and, and all this other stuff. I mean, who's planning that now? You don't even know if any fans are going to the games in, in September and maybe all through the year. So I, I would look for that. The other the other thing I might look for, Rich, is for one part of the schedule to maybe be portable. Let's say the first two or four weeks of the season, mm-hmm. that that <clears throat> if the NFL decides to start the uh, start the season on let's say September 24th instead of September 10th, or start it you know like in week five instead of in week one that you would then take the first two or four weeks of the season and just simply transfer it to the month of January. And, and so I think both those things kind of make sense to do, but this is a strange year. And, you know, and as I wrote today, everybody needs to get used to the fact that there are going to be some things that are going to be uncomfortable and unfair what happens if some municipality or some state says we will not have any uh, large gatherings of people? And that includes 250 people in a football stadium to play a game of football. So, uh, you know, those are the kind of things that everybody, in my opinion, just needs to get used to. Maybe none of them happen, but maybe there's quite a bit of them that happen. And I, I, I think there's going to, be <clears throat> going to be some things that could very well be even unfair to some teams. Maybe one or two teams won't be able to play all their games at home this year. So, you know, and I think everybody should just sigh, take a deep breath and say, hey, it's one year only. So let's just be of good cheer, be of good spirit, not complain about everything and just say, hey, if we really want football to exist, we're going to have to deal with some things this year that are very unusual. Peter, I I, I say uh, I second that emotion. I say plus one, but there's always still going to be Twitter, though, right? <laughs> Is anybody on Twitter happy? <laughs> That's what so. I mean. Peter, thanks for the time. Uh, love your column, uh, and today especially is just as must read as ever. Thanks for the call, as always, Peter. Thank hey, you. Thanks so much, Rich. Appreciate it. You got it at Peter underscore King on Twitter. NBCSports.com, ProFootballTalk.com to check out Football Morning in America. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.